Hi there! This is Critical Care Skills Review. My name is Jihan and I'm here again for another Critical Care Nursing lesson. In this video, I will try to simplify and break down the concept of hemodynamics monitoring for easy and fast learning. Alright, let's dive into our lesson. Okay, first let's define hemodynamics. What is hemodynamics? From the term itself, hemo means blood and dynamics means movement. Therefore, hemodynamics is a general term referring to the movement or flow of the blood. More specifically, this term refers to the measurement of and general principles governing the flow of the blood in the human body. Since our topic is about blood and its movement, let's have a quick review on how the blood flows in our body. To recapitulate the lessons we've learned from the nursing school, I will give you 14 steps on how does the blood flow through the heart. But before that, let's have a look at the basic anatomy of our heart. We already know this from nursing school. Just to refresh us about the basic concept of the anatomy and physiology of the heart. Alright? Our heart have four main chambers the right and left atriums, and the left and right ventricles. The right side of the heart have the right atrium that receives the deoxygenated blood from the body through the superior and inferior vena cava. Superior and inferior vena cava deliver deoxygenated blood or poor oxygen blood from the body to the heart. We have here the tricuspid valve that separates right atrium and right ventricle as well as prevents backflow of the deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle. It opens during atrial contractions and closes during ventricular contractions. The right ventricle re receives the deoxygenated blood from the right atrium and contracts to send the, the deoxygenated blood to the pulmonary circulation for oxygenation. We have here the pulmonary valve that prevents backflows of the blood from the pulmonary artery to the right ventricle, closes during atrial contractions and opens during ventricular contractions. Pulmonary artery are the only arteries in the body that carries deoxygenated blood. They are arteries in the sense that the blood they carry are moving away from the heart. Okay, how about the left side of the heart? In the left side, we have the left atrium. Left atrium received the rich oxygen blood from pulmonary circulation through the pulmonary vein. Left atrium contracts to send the oxygenated blood to the left ventricle. Pulmonary vein are the only veins that carries oxygenated blood from the body. They are veins in the sense that they are carrying blood back to the heart. Here is the mitral valve. This valve opens during atrial contraction and closes during ventricular contractions, therefore preventing backflow of oxygenated blood from the left ventricle to the left atrium. This chamber here is the left ventricle. When this ventricle contracts, it pumps out the oxygenated blood, sending it to the systemic arterial circulation through the aorta. We have another important valve here, this is the aortic valve. This valve closes during atrial contractions and opens during ventricular contraction, thus preventing backflows of the oxygenated blood from the aorta to the left ventricles. Lastly, the aorta. Aorta carries oxygenated blood from the heart to the systemic arterial circulation to provide oxygen and nutrients to our body. That's it. Now, here are the 14 steps on how does the blood flow through the heart. Oxygen-poor blood from the body travels through the inferior or superior vena cava or coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is the one who receives blood from the coronary circulation. Then, the deoxygenated blood enters the right atrium, and after the atrial contraction, blood passes through the tricuspid valve. From the tricuspid valve, blood enters the right ventricle. After the ventricular contraction, 
blood moves through the pulmonary valve and then enters the pulmonary trunk and arteries where the blood is carried to the lungs. Into the lungs, blood loses carbon dioxide and gains oxygen in the pulmonary capillaries. After that process, the oxygenated blood enters the pulmonary veins and then uh, blood enters the left atrium. After that, blood travels through the mitral or bicuspid valve after the atrial contraction and blood enters the left ventricle. After the ventricular contraction, blood moves through the aortic valve and blood travels through the aorta and systemic arteries and to be distributed all over body organs and tissue. Into the body organ and tissue, blood loses oxygen and gains carbon dioxide in the systemic capillaries. And this process will be repeated as long as your heart is working and well. You know in real time the right side and left side of the heart work together. In the right side, blood enters the heart through the two large veins, the inferior and superior vena cava, as I mentioned a while ago, emptying oxygen poor blood from the body into the right atrium. Simultaneously in the left side, the pulmonary vein empties oxygen rich blood from the lungs into the left atrium. During atrial contraction, blood flows from your right atrium into your right ventricle through the open tricuspid valve. When the ventricles are full, the tricuspid valve shuts. This prevents blood from flowing backward into the atria while the ventricles contract. At the same time in the left side of the heart, blood flows from your left atrium into your left ventricle through the open mitral valve or bicuspid valve. When the ventricles are full, the mitral valve shuts. This prevents blood from flowing backward into the atria while the ventricles contract. In the event of ventricular contraction, oxygen and carbon dioxide travels to and from tiny air sacs in the lungs through the walls of capillaries into the blood. In the right side of the heart, blood leaves the heart through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery and to the lungs. While in the left side, Blood leaves the heart through the aortic valve into the aorta and to the body. This pattern is repeated causing blood to flow continuously to the heart, lungs, and body. Alright, how does blood flow process through your lungs? Once blood travels through the pulmonic valve, it enters your lungs. This is called the pulmonary circulation. From your pulmonic valve, blood travels to the pulmonary artery to the tiny capillary vessels in the lungs. Here, oxygen travels from the tiny air sacs in the lungs through the walls of the capillaries into the blood. At the same time, carbon dioxide, a waste product of metabolism, passes from the blood into the air sacs. Carbon dioxide leaves the body when you exhale. Once the blood is purified and oxygenated, it travels back to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. Now that we have done reviewing the heart anatomy and how blood circulates in the heart, let's move on to the fundamentals of hemodynamic monitoring. In more precise clinical definition, hemodynamics is a term to describe intravascular pressure, oxygenation, and blood flow occurring within the cardiovascular system. Hemodynamic monitoring is an essential part of a critical care nursing. As an ICU or critical care nurse, you must have an in-depth understanding of it. So that is why I'm here to help you easily understand the hemodynamics monitoring that is really needed in practicing critical care nursing. Okay, hemodynamic monitoring is a cornerstone in the care of critically ill patients with shock. The primary goals of hemodynamic monitoring are to maintain adequate tissue perfusion by assessing the body's response to the tissue oxygen demand, Alert the healthcare team of an impending cardiovascular crisis before organ injury occurs. It allows physician to identify the pathophysiological mechanism sustaining shock, to target therapy delivery on the pathogenesis of the disease, and to evaluate the effects of treatments over time. Now, coupled with clinical evaluation, hemodynamic monitoring is helpful to guide the administration of fluids, to titrate the dose of vasoactive drugs, and to potentially indicate in a timely fashion when to start 
a mechanical support. Because organ blood flow cannot be directly measured, the non-invasive and invasive mechanical methods must be used. These are the manual or automated blood pressure, oxygen saturation, heart rate and pulses for non-invasive hemodynamics monitoring, arterial blood pressure, central venous pressure, left atrial pressure, pulmonary wage pressure, mixed venous oxygen saturation, and cardiac output measurement for invasive hemodynamic monitoring. Using non-invasive and invasive methods provide quantitative information about vascular capacity blood volume pump effectiveness and tissue perfusion. The indication for hemodynamic monitoring includes all types of shock uh, or all shock states like cardiogenic, neurogenic, anaphylactic, septic shock, and hypovolemic shock. Also includes loss of cardiac function and decreased cardiac output. Now, knowing how circulation works and those hemodynamics monitoring goals, measurements, and the indication are not enough. The critical care nurse should recognize and understand the building blocks of hemodynamics. This building blocks includes heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output, blood pressure, systemic vascular resistance, pulmonary vascular resistance, central venous pressure, pulmonary wage pressure, and the determinants of stroke volume, preload, afterload, contractility, and also mixed venous oxygen saturation. All right, that's the end of our lesson for now. We will continue our review of the hemodynamics monitoring in my next video.